Hi, I'm Beth. I um, have been trading for many years. Like Ethan said, I, I was the second person who organized this group um, in the, in the, let's say, uh, 2000 and zeros. And um, so can I share my screen? Yes, I have it set up that everyone can share. All right, so can you see my screen and my mouse moving around here? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Beth Shapiro. I go by fast options, fast underscore options on socials. I'm not related to Rob, um, but you might find my trading style is somewhat similar to his. I trade opening gaps in the stock market but I don't trade the stock. I trade options on the stock. So this is a leveraged position, has some compelling advantages in my opinion, um, and we'll get to all that. So my style of trading is called scalping, which refers to extremely short hold times. Most days within a few minutes after 9.30, I'm in a trade, and sometimes I'm entirely done by 10. If I'm still at my desk at 10.30 or 11, it's been a really long day. I'm not selling anything. I don't have a, sell a product or a service. And also, I'm not interested in buying anything. But I do welcome new trading buddies. And uh, if you want to reach out to me, please, you're welcome. I love to talk about trading. Okay. So I remind myself to trade like clockwork. This is my nickname for three guiding principles that describe my best practices. I must take positions that are small enough that I stay emotionally rational, don't make bad decisions out of greed or fear. Before I enter a trade, I must know where my stop will be. And it's gonna be beyond the nearest pivot point. Minimizing losses is the single most important thing in trading. And I pay myself first by taking profit targets along the way. My first target is to take off half my position with a 20, uh, 15 to 20% gain, regardless of what the chart looks like. And then I trail a stop um, and I may take out other partial um, sells along the way. So trading talks seem to start with boring risk control stuff. That's because winning starts with not losing. It's boring as can be, winning starts with not losing. So I'm gonna talk about it a bit also. Options add several layers of complexity to trading, in particular leverage and time decay. So just quickly in case someone is uh, new to this, at one contract of an option entitles the owner the right to buy or the option to buy 100 shares of the underlying stock at a specified price. So for example, owning a 200 call on Tesla gives me the option to buy 100 shares of Tesla stock for $200 a share before a certain deadline called the expiration date. And as of yesterday night, when I looked at Tesla, the 200 call was quoted at 245. It says $2.45, but it means you could buy the contract for $245, we work with a multiplier of 100, plus your commissions. Maybe everyone could try to mute themselves. So this is not the same as 100 times leverage. And uh, uh, even though an option, one option contract gives you the option to buy 100 shares of the stock, it's not the same as 100 times leverage. If you don't understand that, don't trade options. Options add really a lot of complexity to trading you can lose your position in a, a blink. If you don't understand the basics of options, you have no business touching them. This is a disclaimer talk. You need to understand what puts are, what calls are, what long options are, what short options are, how options orders are placed, how options are priced, how prices move, what expiration has to do with it, and probably a few of the Greeks. Until you understand these basics, please, 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 please don't trade options. You're welcome to get in touch with me. I love to talk about it, but don't trade it until you understand it. And uh, options is not the same as trading penny stocks. It looks like you can take a big position for a low price, 
but options trading is its own beast because of the way prices move or don't move and decay. So it's not the same as uh, other kinds of instruments. When you think you understand options, you're still gonna get slapped in the face when you get started. Size your position as if you're gonna lose the entire thing. And I don't think I'm exaggerating if I say it happens to everyone, no one's exempt. I cannot stress enough how fast you can lose a ton of money with options. So um, I don't wanna say don't, but this is really uh, what I'm gonna talk about is something I've practiced for a long time and also had my own stumbles at the beginning. Um, so put a lot of warnings ahead of it. Trading options also gives potential for huge gains. Um, but if you don't capture the gains, they can evaporate quickly. So our first job as traders, first of all, is to minimize losses. And that's what I keep reminding myself with my clockwork trading mantras. Small size, tight stop is the right stop. Pay yourself first. Um, also in the name of caution while trading options and slowing down, because of how fast options can burn, I have several guardrails around my trading in addition to those clockwork trading rules. So I trade in a cash account. I don't have margin. I don't need it because options give me so much leverage. So I don't have to deal with pattern day trading rules, but I can only utilize my cash once per day. So options clear in one day. If on Tuesday I trade all my money, I'm done. And Wednesday it's all available again. By comparison, if you trade stocks in a cash account versus options, tr um, stock trades settle on day two or three. So you can trade stocks and day trade stocks in a cash account, but you're going to have your money tied up for another few days. I keep my account small. I know myself. I'm inclined to trade my whole account. So to avoid overtrading, I keep my trading account small, small positions, small account. These are guardrails I have around myself so that I don't go berserk. Uh, in the name of clockwork, I don't leave order execution to chance. As soon as I enter a position, the first thing I do is put in a stop. And the next thing I do is put in an order for my PL target, that 15 to 20%. And then I'm constantly adjusting my stop as the trade develops. And I'm almost never leaving cells to impulse or trigger finger. I don't use hotkeys. And a tip, for really anyone, I would say that narrative journaling is the single most important thing that's helped me become successful. I can't recommend it highly enough. It's, I think it's terrific. If you're looking at my socials, you will stumble upon my journal and I'm um, told it's written in a harsh voice, but yes, I'm, I'm examining my flaws and my mistakes so I can learn and improve. And journaling, I find sometimes a pain, but I really do encourage you to do it even on losing days. Uh, because that's how you can learn and grow. Okay. Beth, hold it. I have two questions. Can you just tell us a little bit when you say pay yourself first, is that like a psychological boost, boost for the day? You, you, make, you make some money, take 50% off the table, and that way you know you've done something good and and spurs you on? I mean, what, what is your rationale? It's, it sort of creates a cushion. You know, there's a lot of emotions, and when you're riding a big gain, you can lose your rationality or your objectivity. And so if I take off part of the position, the remaining position is smaller and it's easier for me to let it ride. If I, because the gains can evaporate so quickly, I, I wanna make sure to lock some in and then it's easier to hold on to the rest for the ride. I see. I have another question too. If um, if you have several days in a row of small incremental gains and it starts growing the account, do you then take some of the some of the money from the account out to keep it small again? Yeah, okay. I I have like a a sweet spot that I feel is where I trade my best, an account size where I feel like I trade my best, and I try to keep myself there. But it's also um, sort of like having a risk manager. You know, I allocate myself a certain amount of money to trade with. And I can ask myself, ask myself as a risk manager, you know, can I take another trade today? And sometimes I'll transfer a little more money in if I think, you know, I can really make a lot out of it. But for the most part, these guardrails are things that help me, you know, 
not do revenge trading or not, you know, things I've examined my bad habits and the things that, and I still have bad habits, but um, I try to put these guardrails around to reduce the chances that I will slip into those bad habits. I think it's excellent. I, I was just curious how that works. I, I just think it's really, really excellent. Any yeah. other questions so far? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, how big is your stop? My stop is below the nearest pivot. I've got a bunch of charts as we go through, okay. and so you'll see how I how I do that. And, and which week do you trade? I, for the most part, I trade this week. The, the, the current the week of expiration. Yeah, this this week's expiration. Sometimes on a Friday, I'll trade a week out because it just decays so fast on a Friday. Um, yeah, but for the most part, I'm I'm also in and out so fast. So ideally, I'm only holding the trade for literally could be even less than a minute or a few minutes. And so I, I'm, even on a Friday, I'm not subject to all that much time decay. Um, uh, well, I'll show you some examples of how even that can burn. Um, may, okay, may, so to quick... May I make a comment? Sure. Um, Hi, Carl. You gave a beautiful narrative as to why uh, people should use simulated trading if they start trading options, because they are very complex and it does take a long time to get that knowledge. So I would just interject, if you're gonna do this, use simulated trading. Yeah, agree. Okay, um, so I mean, with all those cautions, <laughs> why do I trade options? Um, I've traded for a lot of years, I've traded a lot of different methods and I've discovered, especially through journaling, my skills and my temperament and I know that I like scalping. I like to trade the zigs and not the zags. I like to get in and grab my money and get out. So options give good returns for trading really quick moves. And it's not the same as four to one leverage or hundred to one leverage. With that kind of leverage, you are trading more capital. And here I'm trading less capital. Um, so I feel that I can control my risk more easily. I love it that I can make great gains using just a little bit of money. And that's why I like to keep my account small because I can still make the money I want to make. And that guardrail is really, really important to me, as we just said. So um, behaviorally, I know about myself that I have certain weaknesses in my trading discipline. One example is that I will confessions, occasionally yank my stop out at the last minute. I'll just cancel it at the last minute. And it's almost always a bad decision because I'm pretty good at placing, you know, at picking stop points. So canceling a stop is usually going to result in a bigger loss. But I know with an options position, my max loss can't be more than everything. And so I can control how much I'm actually risking by controlling my position size. If everything goes downhill in a handbasket, I know that I can only lose my entire position. So it, even though I strive to not lose the entire position, my position is sized so that if I lose the whole thing, I'm not hurt. I may be at my max loss or I may be, but I'm not, I'm not gonna get hurt. Um, so trading in a cash account is really another important part. Um, when I'm done, when I run out of settled cash, I'm done. Not maybe I'll just try one more. Oh, oh, that looks really good because options clear overnight. The next day I'm back and I've had a fresh head and I uh, come back with, with my money back reinstated. So just to stress, and we're going to talk, and this is going to come in over and over again. I trade the movement of the stock by buying and selling an option. So my rules and my entries have to, my, my entries and my exits, for example, have to do with the movement of the stock price. But I'm trading it by trading an option. 
So we're going to go into options a little more. I buy calls to take a bullish position. So a stock trader would call that going long. I buy calls and I buy puts to take a bearish position. So a stock trader might say, I'm going short. I am buying puts. Um, so I'm looking, I, I live in this bold faced row here that I buy to open a call or sell to close a call when I want to be in a bullish trade. I profit when the stock goes up and for a bearish trade, I want to profit when the stock goes down. I'm buying a put and buying to open a put and then selling to close the put. In these squares, it's not by mistake that there's question marks here. Um, there are lots of other kinds of strategies that other traders use, like going short or writing covered calls or naked calls or cash secured puts or naked puts and all kinds of fancy things like straddle strangles, iron condors, etc. I, I truly don't know anything about that. I strictly buy to open a call position when I want to go bullish on the stock and I buy to open puts when I want to go bearish on the stock. And superficially, I may say I was short, but it's always through a, put, a long puts position. Okay. Which, Beth, before we go in, which platform are you using? Because this is, this is all about speed, right? I mean, you must be incredibly fast to do this. I mean, I, I can't trade that quickly. <laughs> there is a speed factor, but I use automated orders. So I have my trigger points. I know, I know where I'm going to stop. So I enter in an order for if it, a contingent order. If it does that, then I sell. We'll come to that, but it's basically it's automated. So it is fast and it sometimes happens fast. And because I don't trust myself to pull the trigger exactly when I need to, I put in and make the decision and the computer for the most part does it. Is this TD Ameritrade? That's what I was getting at. Which this is... is Schwab's Street Smart Edge. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, for example, this is an options chain that I captured, I think, last night um, for Netflix. So, this top section is near the money calls. Near the money means that, oh, hang on, maybe someone can speak up if they have no idea what an option is. Like, let me know how basic I need to speak here. Does anyone want super beginner level explanations or can we? Yes, please. Okay, great. Who said that? Uh, it's Pete. Pete, hi Pete. Hi. Okay, so we're looking at Netflix um in this upper section calls the gray ones are in the money and the white ones are out of the money so for example if the stock price was 309 in between here that just is what uh differentiates between in the money and out of the money so the strike prices in this column this is the the ticker symbol of the option, which is something quite long, and I've just chopped it off here for myself to save room. This was outside market orders, so there's no last trade. The bid and the ask, and one of the very important things that I'm looking for is tight spreads. A, a spread could, you know, that's a relative term, let's say. Option spreads are wider than a stock trader typically wants to see, but you you have to uh, live with a bunch of slippage, I guess, as a as an options trader. I look at Delta. Delta is one of the Greeks that says, for, if Netflix moves a dollar, this is going to move twenty eight cents. And the pricing here, sorry, the three ten Netflix call will move twenty eight and three quarter cents. These are expressed in dollars and cents, but if I want to buy one 310 call, I'm going to pay $315, not $3. So this there's a multiplier of 100 involved here. You get used to it, believe it or not. Okay. 
um, volume. This isn't open yet. This is open interest. This is something else I'm looking for. These two columns, volume and open interest. That gives me a sense of the liquidity of the option. So, for example, strangely enough, uh, the 305 put has an open interest, which is something like overnight people who have held it overnight of 2000, but only 30 at 312.50. So to me in general, I'm going to be looking to trade something that has more open interest and more volume versus less. And if I wanted to trade in this range, I wouldn't trade this one that has 30. I'd probably go for the other. But also when the market opens, I want to see what the volume in the moment is. And implied volatility is an indicator of how wild the ride is going to be. Um, and so this in this screen, we're looking at calls, which I circled in green for bullish. For me, it's a bullish play to buy a call. And puts in red, it's a bearish play for me to buy a put. Okay, and then we're going to move on to a different kind of example where we're going to talk about time decay quickly. So these are both puts on SPY, SPY. The difference is the top section, these are going to expire in two days. Again, I took this, must have been last night or this morning. And the and the set below expires in four days. These have more time. The closer you get to when they expire, the less value is involved in them. So for example, a 400 put that expires in two days is here close to $5. And a 400 put that expires in four days is here close to $6. It's the same thing. You just have more time for the trade to play out and you pay a premium for more to, to buy more time. You're buying time, literally. Uh, and of interest also is that the volume and the, well, the open interest in the spy puts is in the tens of thousands versus in Netflix was in the few hundreds or maybe a few thousands. Also, you can see on Netflix, the or let's sorry, go to this one. This is the same two um, things we just looked at. Netflix is approximately $310 stock. I didn't look to see what it did today. And we see that the puts are above $10. And SPY is a $400 instrument, equity, uh, ETF. And the, and the puts are in the $5, $6 range. So there's other things involved in the price besides just the price of the underlying stock. So this is where I repeat my emphasis on understanding what's involved in the options price and how it's gonna move and where the liquidity is or is not necessarily. So um, that's one of the very important things to know if you're going to be trading options. I think on any time frame, whether you're swing trading options farther out or scalping options, you know that same day. Um, do you, uh, to... uh, Beth? Do you use any other pre-market information to decide on? Yep. You know, if, yeah. We're coming into that right now. Okay. So we're going to go to my desk. This is my desk. I have a 4K television connected to my laptop. Wow. Um, at the top, at the top, this top part of the big screen, I have what I call bird eye view. I watch several tickers over here. I'm watching spy and QQQ. And over here are things on my watch list um, for the most part. These rotate around and these are pretty fixed. Across here, the bottom part is one ticker where I'm watching a daily, a 60 or 15 and a five. And then on the laptop is sort of the trading part. I've got the options chain and the level two and et cetera. Um, and this screenshot is, or this uh, photo is actually quite old. I haven't seen my desk that clean for a little while, but glad I took a picture while it was clean one day. Uh, all right. so. Just to reiterate before we really dive in, 
I'm looking to trade the movement of the stock by buying an option, either a call or a put. So that my rules and my entries and a, part, a significant part of my system has just a lot to do with the movement of the stock price. And that's where I get my signals or my triggers to buy and sell, but I'm gonna buy or sell the option. So I get to my desk around 9 a.m. and I look at my screeners. Here's what I'm screening for. Stock price greater than 20, average daily volume over 1.5 million, a gap of at least one and a half percent, either up or down. And in more volatile markets, I may change that. I may, you know, not settle for a 1.5 percent gap. I might look for a two percent gap or more. And then I sort this whole screener by pre-market relative volume. So I'm going to go through this list, which sneak preview, spoiler, we're going to see it over here. Um, go through this list and I just look at each of the hits to this screener and then I'm looking for certain patterns. Not every gap is the kind of thing I want to trade. So I'm looking for certain patterns on the daily chart, something like it's doing something new, gapping out of a short-term base like a flag or a long-term base like a multi-week support or resistance level. And then I want to look at the options. So I have a, first I want to screen for the kind of gaps I'm looking for. And then I want to see the kind of chart I want to look for. And then I want to see if the options are tradable. So I got a quick question. Yeah. When you talk about gaps and the pre-market, are you ever looking at the catalyst behind the gap? Mm -hmm. and you weigh that catalyst, like if it's an earnings or the Ukraine thing that uh, Ethan was talking about. Do you look um, at the catalyst? I do. I, I, let's say it like this. I prefer a catalyst, but I don't look all that deeply into it because I want all I want to know is that a lot of people are going to be in this arena. I want to know there's going to be a lot of people looking at it and a lot of people trading it, and there's going to be action. So I don't necessarily, I'm, I'm going to hold this thing for, you know, 10 minutes like I don't necessarily care what's moving it I just care that it's moving and if there's a reason all the better okay um at the open so I found all the stocks I want to follow I've put them in my bird's eye view probably and in a watch list and at first I'm watching daily charts I want to see what that gap looks like on the chart when it opens. And then when I think it has increasing potential, I switch to a one minute chart because that's where I'm gonna get my signal. And then I'll probably bring it down. You know, if it's something I'm really getting ready to trade, I'll move it, I'll take it from this bird eye view and put it into this more active view. Excuse me. Um, these three windows are linked also to this one. So getting four, sort of different time frames on the same chart and I'm looking for I, I'm planning out levels in advance for the few stocks I'm watching but um really getting ready to see those levels come into play so I only know what the spreads are on the option and what the volume is on the option when the options open which is 9 30 there's no pre-market for the options or at least I don't have access to pre-market for options um, so I know that if I want to do a bullish play, I'm going to buy a call. And if I'm going to do a bearish play, I'm going to buy a put. And for the most part, I'm going to buy the first out of the money option in my direction. I, there's, there are some factors I'm looking for, like if the next option is much more liquid and I think the stock can make a bigger move, I might consider that but for the most part i'm going to look at the first out of the money option in my direction the option has to have good volume it has to have a tight spread and again um to reiterate i'm trading the movement of the stock by buying and selling the option so it's um i'm watching the chart of the stock i'm not watching a chart of the option 
I'm watching a chart of the stock and my triggers, well, we'll get to that. Um, let's see what else I wanted to say on the slide. Okay, yeah, when when it triggers, I'm, I'm using a lot of market orders. So that's another reason that I need to really prefer tighter spreads because, uh, you know, I don't want a 30% spread, you know, that's more than my, um, loss tolerance basically just in the spread uh back to risk management tight stop is the right stop i don't um i haven't figured out and if someone would like to teach me i'm very open to it i haven't don't use our units our, like risk units strictly but generally for perspective if the whole trade goes against me if i enter and I never get my PL target and it goes straight to my stop, I'll probably lose around 20%. So maybe you call that a one hour loss. And my first profit target is usually around 20%. So maybe let's say my first profit target is, you know, one to one um, profit target. And then often, when the, my PL target hits, I can also move my stop up. So the rest of the trade evolves. So uh, let's see. My first profit target is usually about 20%. And that's, let's say, approximately 1R for people who are interested in risk unit talk. I, I tend to think in percentages. And then subsequent targets have to do not with profit and loss, but with support and resistance levels. So that's where I'm looking for price targets on the underlying stock um, for different kinds of targets. But before I know my precise entry, before I know how the entry signal is going to set up on the stock and before I know what the option price is going to be when I execute it, I know where my stop is going to be. So the first thing I do, and sometimes even before I enter the trade, I enter the stop and the stop is going to be a contingent order. We'll see the order screen a little farther down. Um, but it's basically going to say, you know, if Tesla trades below, I don't even know what Tesla's trading at now. If Tesla trades below 199, then sell my op, my call. So it's if the stock price triggers below this pivot, then close my option position. That's what my orders look like. Beth, do you trade your, are your stops based upon Stock price or option price? Are you asking me, do I size my position based on the- No, I'm asking if your stop is, is triggered by the stock price or an option price. Stock price. Stock. Uh-huh, and it's gonna be a market order on, this, on the option. That's why I find it a little hard to talk about our risk units because I, it's, it's like a sophisticated calculation to figure out exactly what, you know, my execution will be on the option based on the stock price in the context of a flush. So, but I, but I know from my data that um, a f what I call a full loss, you know, is usually in the ballpark of 20 minus 20%. So when you say, Beth, your first profit target is 20%, is that 20% higher of the stock entry price? No, uh, of the option. Oh, the option. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the, the software on Schwab gives you that percent automatically? You don't have to calculate anything? Correct. I can. It's one of the things I can show in my position. When I show the position, I can see the P&L on the position, live P&L on the position. Huh. Okay, this morning, this was my screener when I got to my desk. So I'm looking at the symbol. What I'm really looking at is I'm looking at, it's sorted by uh, relative volume in the pre-market. So you can see SE at about 9.15 this morning had already done one and three quarters million out of an average volume of it's close to six. So this was already, you know, doing massive, ma did anyone trade SE today? Anyone? Okay. Um, 
so it's sorted by relative volume and then i'm going down this list and looking at charts to see where if i have my setup so for example we're going to click back and forth a bit here se looked like this in the pre-market it was gapping just almost up to, i hope you can see this on your screens um it was gapping just to under this pink downtrend line so i don't want it unless it goes above the trend line but i'm gonna watch it because it was looking really good and then i looked at the five minute chart and i see it's doing a lot of action so this is a potential candidate so now i want to see what that if the option is um gonna be tradable it hasn't opened yet and i see there's some open interest and the implied volatility is bonkers <laughs> like 200 is really bonkers um but this goes into the bird eye view this goes on the watch list it's a possibility okay the next one swks the chart looked like this it was gapping up i don't even remember where uh 97 let's say so it was gapping up to about here and i see that it had already run up quite a lot and i can see that the pre-market it really wasn't getting any action it was almost like a weird tick or something so move on that's not a candidate uh the next one on the list was mur this is mur it was gapping but inside these two bars and also the pre-market trade looks real sloppy i'm not interested ew so ew nope i guess i skipped ew for some reason so Beth, I have another quick question, but, uh, uh, but I just want to understand this. So when, like, I'm just, I'd never heard of SE, so I'm still trying to figure out what they do. But um, anyway, I don't care what they do. They what? I don't care what they do. Yeah, no, I, I got that. Okay. <laughs> but but I would. So, you know, it looks like they had a quarter three earnings beat, so that's why they gapped up. Yeah. But you go into this not knowing like how much the the how many how much what percent the stock is short you don't look at any of that nope uh, so how do you know it's going to keep going up i don't i know that it i know that it has a lot of power behind it but i also know that it was going to be stuck under this we're going to go into this se trade in detail in a minute but um it was stuck under this trend line. And a lot of times you see that, for example, I see the next one that I flagged out of that watch list was Macy's, which also had news. And it was gapping just up here to this blue line, below the blue line. So it was gapping up after a few days run up and just under the ceiling. So I'm not interested in it unless it can break through, but it'll go on the watch list. And I see in the pre-market, it had good action. So I look at the options and the options look like they have potential. So that goes on the watch list. And then I looked at MGM and MGM was gapping up a smidge, but I didn't like this pattern and it had already had a several day run up. So that one's out. And then I guess I, okay, back to SE. So this is a repeat of that other slide because now I'm gonna go through a pro progression of examining this se as a potential trade i have a question Beth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's the word gap and gapping okay i'm not sure if it's the same definition as robert uses i think so you think it, it can you show me the same can yeah, none of these charts, the stock hasn't opened yet. These are all pre-market and my thing doesn't, sh I'll show you one second. We're going to see, where are we? 20, 21, where's the daily chart of this, where it's gapping? Okay, here you see the stock opened. I don't know if you can see this tiny blip right here. Oh, okay. That's oh, where okay. the stock opened. So the gap is the space in between, well, technically where it closed here, right. where it opened up here. Okay, I didn't see that. 
So yeah, that wasn't on the previous slide. I was, that's before the market opened. Yeah, okay. And then here you see the market opened and the options opened. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay. So, so well, now the stock is open, but it's still below this trend line. So I want to see it pull back and then get above this pink downtrend line um, for me to start being interested. But I see that it's got, um, I, I don't like, look at the spread, for example. If I was going to take the first out of the money option right now, that's $3 by $4.45. That's $1.50 on a, that's a, could be a 50% spread. <laughs> so I'm not, and it's only got a volume of eight so far, eight option contracts at that price. So I'm not interested in this yet because of, because the option is not tradable for me. Okay, now we're gonna fast forward a few minutes later. In the first few minutes, the stock shot up from what, 55.50 or 56 to 58.50. So this did like a 4% move right away. <laughs> and the option, um went up a smidge only two more only two more contracts were sold eight versus or ten versus eight and the price went up a little the spread is still too wide for me and the stock is a runaway trade so i'm not interested in entering this right now because it's already too extended so fast forward another few minutes it starts to flag a little bit and the 56th call is off the map now so we can start looking at the 60 call i don't i don't know what the 56 call went to i'm sorry this is so small but i was trying to get like all the information on here so in terms of a stock trade i like the flagpole i like seeing the flag i like this volume pattern pattern all right i just need to wait for my entry next step Next step is the flag starting to fail a little bit. And I expanded this screen. So now you can see that also in the lower right corner of this, uh, this is the whole screen actually. I also tracked the SPY. This is a one minute chart of the SPY. So I see that SPY also did the first three bars up and then it chopped. And now it's testing the VWAP at the same time as this little flag is kind of failing. And the 60 option is now $2.36 by $2.70. It's, I know that's really hard to see now. Um, just so you can see the rest of what's going on here, I see the level two, the time of sales of SE. And this is a contingent order window up here. Okay, what happens next? I'm, I'm referring to my notes also. Ah. What I did want to show you back here was the difference between this, which looks like a pretty good flag with a, maybe a support level in here, mid 59s. And then two minutes later, it's 59 versus, it dropped a dollar basically in these two minutes, two minute bars. And at the same time, the SPY is starting to look a little lousier. So I'm not, you know, in the, in the uh, what do they say? A rising tide lifts all boats. But if, the opposite, if the market is dropping, I'm not expecting mine to be the one that's gonna all of a sudden expand this massive opening move that it made. I need market support. So even if I liked the stock, regardless of what the option um, spread was, I'm, I'm not yet interested in buying this. Um, all right, fast forward, here's what happened next. I covered these windows, so you wouldn't, I, I, whatever, my account information wound up in the front. It did drop out of this flag. And then if I was gonna trade it, this bar would be the one that I would like to buy, this 941 bar. So 
we can see in the SPY that at 941, we got this, uh, what's this called? Gravestone doji or something, this basically reversal bar. So when the, S when the market's doing a reversal, um, let's say I entered on this bar and then it can't get going anymore and the market is really failing, I would move up my stop. So let's say I bought in this bar, forget the options, just a generalized buy signal in this bar. My initial stop would be right below here, below 58, so maybe 57.96 or something. And I don't think this move would have given me my initial 20% profit target. So, but when I see everything weakening, I probably would have moved up my stop to here, like just below 59, because the market is weakening. And I, this is tight stop is the right stop. So I don't want, I don't want to go all the way back down to here. That would be on the option, a very big loss, especially with the spread, which is why I'm not in it anyway. But uh, so let's see what happens next. SPY down some more. SE down some more. And at this point, I really wouldn't have wanted to be in it anymore. That's why tight stop is the right stop. Um, I can just tell you, I know this is really hard to see, but the 60 call, which would have been the one that I would have trade, traded, had been um, in this buy signal bar, whenever I did the screen grab, had been like 297 by 315. And where am I? Slide number 24. And now, oh, nope. No, sorry. Ignore those numbers. We are in slide 20, 26. So I have notes in a different page. Um, okay. I said what I wanted to say here. Let's move on. Ah. This is the end of when I'm talking about SE. So I think what I was trying to show in this series is how I look at the screener. I go through the screener to find reasonable picks that I wanna watch. And then when that market opens, I pick the one I wanna focus on or two or whatever. Well, one or two, I'm not very good at managing a lot of <laughs> trades at the same time um, and then I wait for my open and I'm watching the option price as it progresses so I have some more trades that are more textbook trades for me to talk about next but let's break here and see if there's questions there okay 27 so this is what you usually see me showing you when I journal, I go to TradingView, which I TradingView.com, which I think is a terrific site, and I annotate the charts um, to add to my journal. And this is in addition to my narrative journaling, why I took this trade and what else was happening at the same time and other kinds of thoughts about risk management, et cetera. It's very helpful to see the picture. So upper left is the daily chart and the right is the one minute chart. And in the lower left uh, is the SPY, usually sometimes Qs, because I'm watching that at the same time. So this was a few days ago, Disney. It had a major, major gap down. Did anyone trade Disney last week on earnings, this gap down? Um, huge gap down and this 90 was like a multi, multi, multi year level going back to like 2015, it bounced off of 90 a lot of times. So this looked really juicy. Um, and here's how I traded it. After this big flush, it bounced. This purple line is the VWAP. Sorry. Um, I'm watching the level two. I'm watching the time in sales. And over here, I bought puts. And then I took a 15% profit target here. And then it kept, and then as it went down, I moved my, oh, my initial stop was up here. 
Okay, entered here, my initial stop above the pivots because I'm short via long puts, I'm short. When it did this little mini base here, I moved my stop to here. And then when it flushed again to new day's low, this was the previous day's low, I'm watching the level two and I'm watching the time and sales and I'm saying to myself, I don't wanna give this any room back up. So I squeezed my stop way, 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 way down. And when it bounced back up, I got out. These are all market, uh, the entry and this exit on the stop are market orders. This is a limit order for my profit target. Now, you might look at this and say, ah, well, it went so much farther down later. That's not my trade. That's not my money. I'm zigs, no zags. <laughs> I want this flush and then I'm done. That's, that's my money. And if I would have sat through this, I would have been really upset. Uh, okay, next example. This was a gap above a short-term level. So I identified this little base in here, this little flag. It gapped above, and these are a lot of moving averages that I don't necessarily use as signals, but I know other people are using them, so I'm watching them. And I call this like gapping into the tangle. So I wanna see it get out of this tangle, but I like this gap out of the range. Um, it took calls here. So it made a first move, it pulled back and then it's hard to see here, but this was a pre-market support level. So it bounced off of that. It didn't, this bar didn't close very well, but I had calls and my initial stop would be below here. This was hard to sit through. <laughs> um, but then I took my first target off at 34%. So the way that happens is in this run up, I was able to squeeze a little bit more. I was able to not give it room, but get more than that 20%. But then I'm still tightening up the stop and I tightened it below these two bars. So when it came, it made a new day high, came back in and then I stopped out. Now I missed this and I missed that, but I wouldn't have wanted Right, I, I, I look at these things and I say that I got my money. I got my piece of the trade and I'm at peace. That's my uh, another little bit I say to myself a lot. I got my piece and I'm at peace. Someone else made more money here. That's not my money. And I definitely wouldn't have made it through this pullback. So I got my money. This is nice money. And I was really happy about this. Next. Yes. Yes. Are the percentages your profit percentage or the size of trade exit? The profit percentage. So the first half I took off at 30 with 34% gain here. Interesting that at a similar price, I only got a 24% gain because that's the difference between selling it for a limit or selling for a market. Or I don't know if this was a Friday, but the way that sometimes the option can decay really fast. Yeah, I found that uh, momentum really pushes the option price. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, do you trade options? What do you trade? Uh, yeah, credit spreads and less, currently less uh, debit spreads right now. So I'll be switching it back over to debit spreads. And I'm, I'm interested to see what you're doing because I'm weighing the options of, uh, <laughs> of uh, trading spreads versus just buying out right i would love to talk about it i don't know what spreads are but we can try to share some knowledge and figure out you get you can uh, reach me at at fast options on uh twitter and instagram okay great thanks okay um so now we're on 29 this is marathon oil was gapping above this i'm calling it a long-term level this Resistance level here, gapped above it. So it made a run, it pulled back. And then as it was looking to, I'm watching the level two in the time of sales and I'm watching for it to keep going, resume basically this uptrend. So I bought calls here. On this big bar, I got out. Oh, sorry, initial stop would have maybe been 20 below here. 
I quickly would have moved it up to below here. And then when I took this out, I would have probably moved my stop to here. And then over here, I got chicken. I don't know what spooked me. Let's see, this was 945. Maybe it spooked me that the market was doing this around the same time. I don't know, something spooked me here and I got out sort of at the bottom of that bar and missed this whole thing. But I got my piece. This is a nice trade. I got my piece. Um, this is AMD. This is already back to September. Um, gap down. It's kind of extended. I don't know when I look at it now, I managed to convince myself at the time that it wasn't already extended, but I must have thought this was a little uh, consolidation. And in the one minute chart, it started up. When it made a new day low, I got short. This must have been really hard for me because I only took a 9% profit target. I must have been, I don't see, I didn't put the SPY on this one. So I don't know what, I guess, spooked me out of that. Um, but that's why I take a partial. When I took half of it off, it helped me calm down about managing the rest of the trade. And I was able to let the second half of it ride pretty nicely. This is a uh, interesting thing that I wanna make sure to talk about. This was a short-term level that it was gapping below. It traded up when it started coming down again, I bought puts. Um, my initial stop would have been up here. And I think I circled these tails because these didn't, um, not that they didn't necessarily happen, but it was like a flash and it didn't trigger my order. So I'm still in. This is longer than I want to be in a trade. I mean, this is already nine, let's say 9.35 till after 10 o'clock. I'm still in this trade. I'm sweating. That's not where I like to be and get to new day low. And I still haven't made it to 20%. I must have squeezed my stop down really tight to capture what I could. Got some out over here, rode this up for an in some insane reason that I can't remember now. But you can see that when it came down to it, a lower low, there was decay on this option. So I made less profit even though uh, someone who shorted the stock would have made more profit here, the time decay in the option makes me get less profit. And then this last piece, even less though, it's higher. So that's the, what I wanted to show here is that a lower stock price doesn't necessarily correlate to better gains on a put position because of time decay. Um, I mean, should we cut here? I have three more and then questions. Anyone interested in seeing more or should we just go ahead to questions? Oh no, show us more. This is great. This is great. And my quick question, uh, if you don't mind me asking it now, is the time decay, because I don't trade options. So that's in the minutes, not in the days. So I don't know if someone remembers what day of the week September 1st was, but it seems to me that in an hour, a lower low, yeah, I mean, I'm trading the same week options. So the time decays quickly that in an hour, the same stock price is not necessarily gonna give me the same price on the option. It's Thursday. Was a Thursday. Okay, so the closer, I'm trading a Friday expiration. So it was one day out or two days out, I guess. And, and it's gonna lose, it's gonna, time is money. It's gonna lose money quickly because it doesn't have very much time left on it. Lawrence, did you have a question? No, I was just saying that it was Thursday, it was this day. I might add, if she were 30 days out from expiration, the time to give decay would almost be negligible. You wouldn't notice it. So but for the same, but right. the option would have been more expensive. Right. Um, 32. This was a continuation gap down. 
Um, I was also looking at this 167 level. It started with a big move up. So I want anyone who was thinking about buying this, I want them to be done buying. All the shorts who are trying to cover and anyone who thinks they're gonna get a good bargain, I want them to be done buying. And I wanna catch it when the new sellers are coming in. So I must have looked at a level here, 161, I don't know, 80 or 90, and said below here, people, you know, the, the tide has shifted and I'm gonna get, I mean, that's when I'm gonna take my shirt. So here I opened puts and it tried and then came back up and I stopped. So my initial stop must have been, sometimes I put a stop above the triggering bar. So maybe my stop was 162.50 in here. And, and I stopped for a 16% loss here. It did do what I thought it was going to do later. Um, either I wasn't watching it anymore or didn't have any money left to trade in my cash account or didn't think at 10 o'clock I was going to, let's see what the market was doing at 10 o'clock. Maybe I thought the market was strengthening up and so I didn't want to take a new short at the time. But in this case, I missed it, took a loss. Uh, even if I had maybe the right premise, I had the wrong entry and the wrong stop. I, I don't think it's the wrong stop. I don't think there's anything wrong with this trade. This is a trade and I look at it and I say, I followed my rules and I took a loss this time. That happens. This, in my mind, in retrospect, is a bit of a stretch. This is Roku. And I think I figured there was sort of a level here that it was gapping above. Um, and it ran up. I waited for a pullback. It bounced off of VWAP. So when it came above this opening bar in this pre-market level, I tried to buy calls. And I gave it a, maybe I should have stopped here, but I gave it a little extra room, stopped here, wrong. And, and Roku, I have, saying to myself that Roku eats its young, <laughs> meaning Roku, whoever um, is the market maker for Roku really knows where the stops are and really knows how to lure people in and flush them out. And I, I think I should blacklist Roku, honestly, because I, I think I probably have a losing average on Roku. I find it very difficult to trade. So Here's another example of very difficult for me to trade. Uh, last one. This is Shopify on August 11th. I'm calling it a gap above a long-term level, which I must have thought was here at 42-ish. And it's gapping above. Here, for whatever reason, I was watching the queues that day. Um, it initially traded up, or maybe that was in the pre-market. I can't tell which time that was. It flushed down, and when it made a new day high, I entered calls. I got in a little late, and this I really um, thought could move, and so I was trying to stay in it. Um, when it bounced off the VWAP, I added and then took an initial profit of 41%. Here I stopped on some more. Sorry, the initial stop would have been here. After I added the next, I would have raised the stop on the whole position to below this pivot. Here I took a target and I would have moved my stop to below this bar. And then as it moved up, I must have wanted to get more money out of it. So I tightened my stop up, but obviously I left a little bit more. And that last piece, maybe it was only one call. Uh, did quite well. So this is a grand finale. This is a nice trade to go out on. Something else to note here is that this climb, this part of the climb was on kind of low volume. This peak run came in on high volume, but the last part of the peak came on lower volume, which is another sign to tighten up my stop and not give it any more room. And I love how I exited this because it got worse after that. Um, 
these are some questions that I got in advance. So we can you can see if anything here didn't get answered or if it strikes you or if you have your own questions, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, what platform are you actually putting your trades on? Is it trading to you or? So the my platform that I trade on is Street Smart Edge from Schwab. That's what this is. Okay. But when I after I trade, um, this Street Smart Edge doesn't have great annotation tools. So after I trade, I journal. I annotate charts in Trading View like this, and annotate, and then I put this screen grab into my narrative journal, which is online. If you okay, yeah, I, I kind of struggle with Thinkorswim as well. It's a little Yeah, awkward. Thinkorswim I find, yeah. Uh, I, in general, I like Schwab, and I, in general, I like the Street Smart Edge. I, what I really like is the contingent orders, or sorry, the conditional orders, right? So an order for me would be, I guess you probably can't see this depending what kind of screen you're looking at, but it's, we'll say, if we're talking about SE in this case, if SE trade price is below 59 or 58, 96, whatever I decide, then sell this option, right? So I can set the trigger based on the movement of the stock price, because that's what I'm looking at. So the trigger is on the stop price, but the order is the option that I'm holding, if that makes sense. And Thinkorswim can do that also. It's, I find it not as easy. Like I can preload this order window, so I don't have to type it all in, for example. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I have, I have one of each account, um, but I really haven't traded on top. So this is a good example. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Let's see how to do that. Back to you, Ethan. I have some comments if you want to hear some feedback. Yes. Um, I like what you did in a nutshell. Um, you have very specific criteria. You identified that to us. And the other thing I really like is the this is my money. This is not my money. You, you don't cry over spilt milk uh you know once you get your profit you're happy with it and um i'm sure many times if you didn't you would lose it yeah that's and what i look at it and i say i followed my rules and i got my money right and when i don't follow my rules it usually does not lead to more money <laughs> yeah I like that very much. So I, I thought your presentation was really good. Thank you. I, I concur. I thought it was great. I was on mute before. I didn't realize it. Uh, does anyone have any? What, let's see, what time are we at? 9.09. We're a little early. Um, let's see. Does anyone have any questions for Beth? Or I have, uh, let's do the I have a question. Yeah, go, John. Welcome, John. Hi. You might have you might have already said this. I I ended up in a meeting about an hour late. But uh, when you get into the trade, did you say you were getting in uh, at the market? Uh, uh, what 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 uh, particular options are you looking for? It's usually uh, for example, the what first is, what is out the of the money operation? option. All right. So at the money and the soonest expiration date. It's usually, right, it's usually the same week expiration and it's usually the first out of the money option, usually. Out of money. Hey, thank you. Is there, uh, sorry, is there any stats you wanna share about, you know, mm -hmm. win percent or anything? It's up to you. 
Um, there's a little bit of stats in my blog. I don't, I, my win rate goes between 60 and 70%. Um, that's another stat that I find hard to calculate. I just average my winning days by my losing days. Um, trade by trade, I find it difficult because um, there's a lot of variables, I feel like. Like sometimes I've taken two positions and, or two contracts, or sometimes I've taken 15 contracts. So sometimes I've taken one exit or three exits. It's one entry for the most part. Sometimes there's an ad. You know, what constitutes one trade? Is it one exit? Is it one? So my stats are based on day outcome. So my it's about six between sixty and seventy percent winning versus losing days. Okay, thanks, Beth. Hi. I don't uh, do uh, social media exactly. I can do email or text. Is there a way to contact you by either um, of those methods? I'll put my phone number in the chat. Okay. Um. Uh, Beth, I do the same thing uh, by uh, by day. I, I have a measure my profit expectancy mm -hmm. which is around sixty seven percent right now, and uh, I'm currently the last two and a half months I've been doing these statistics with based on one contract uh, traded per day, and so I'm I'm the same way. I don't I don't track it by number of trades. I track it either I've I've stopped out at my max loss or I've made money, which doesn't have a max to it. Yeah. So I, I, I'm similar. What I'm what I'm actually focusing on right now in terms of analysis is I've tried to give consistent naming to the setups. It's a long term break or a short term break or it's a. a a fade or it's a 60 minute setup versus a daily setup. I have about six different nuanced, it's a lotto trade, there's a lotto trade also. Um, and I'm trying to track my success based on the different setups. And you know, perhaps some of the setups need to go, for example, or some need to come into rotation and out of rotation. Um, so that's my, that's a focus of my, I guess, data analysis recently. Yeah, I, I want to ask a question. I want to go back to, so you were talking about the pivot points. Is that what you're using the chart and the lines to see? Like, sometimes I notice at the open, certain stocks will gap up. And then the question is, are they going to keep going or are they going to come down? So are you- what That is, is the ultimate question. Yeah. How do you know? How do you know? Like Bank of America today, which I own. So Bank of America gapped up and then started going down. Uh, so you never know if it's going to keep going or come back What's down. What's the ticker there? BAC. It gapped up. It gapped up to a price that was inside yesterday's bar. It gapped up, but it didn't really do anything new, if that right. makes sense. So to me, that's not the kind of gap I'm interested in. That's not a relevant gap. That's a gap within a range. I, I don't expect those to continue. Right. I see. I see. Because see, this gets back for me to knowing what you're trading, because when you have these stocks these little companies which i call the one day wonders and suddenly there's news and um and they go up and sometimes they keep going up for a little bit and then they crash down lorraine if, if you can hear me what was that viru that you were playing that went up oh yeah that was <laughs> right Does anyone else have any questions about James, P, Chris, Lorraine, Jay? Uh, um, I, I got a question, Stephen. Hi. Uh, hey, Beth, you might, you, you might have answered this uh, already. Um, when you put in the, the order, uh, do you put in the stop as part of that order? 
No, I do a separate order. I have a place where I can put in, I can enter brackets, including a percentage gain and loss bracket at the same time as I place the order. But I don't use that because I don't have a percentage loss as my stop. My stop is based on a pivot and I don't know what the option price will exactly be when the stock goes below that pivot or beyond that pivot. So I don't do it in an automated way. I will sometimes put a profit target on the bracket, but in the automated way, I have to do it on the whole position. I only want to take off half at a profit target. So it, for the most part, I prefer to do it manually. Right. Yeah, it's just that, you know, it can move on you very quickly. So by the time you get to the top, it moved against you pretty far. So you're you know crackling up a little bit. You're saying that it could move against me really, really fast, and I wouldn't have a ch chance to enter my uh, order? Or, or, or never had a chance to enter in your stop. It's, it has happened. It has happened, yeah. and then I have to, you know, just go get in there and sell it manually. But right, uh, if it doesn't happen very often, and if also if I'm worried about it happening because of the way the contingent orders work, sorry, the conditional orders work, is I can enter the stop before I enter, so I can have the stop like pre sitting there before I even open the trade. I get, you. I get you. But I don't do that very often either. Right. Okay, thank you. I, I wanted to make one more comment. I, I meant to make it earlier. Um, from years ago, when I studied options, it was very complicated. And the thing I liked about what you do is you've simplified it. I mean, you 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 have a, a small enough criteria that I can understand it. It still has its complexities, like time decay can be tricky. And uh, the way, I don't know, someone also just said it before, like if the price makes a, a really volatile move, the option gets amplified disproportionately amplified so it's a great time to sell but it's not a great time to buy yeah and the other thing that i liked um you only buy you buy to go long you buy to go short um is that based upon experience or is that just something you learned and you've just followed along because of the simplicity or what did you base just, that? Decision? If you think back to that little chart where I use those bold face um, row and the and the other row, like I literally don't understand it. I mean, I I know a lot about how to trade in my wheelhouse, and I don't know anything else about options. So if there's, it would be a terrible risk for me to try to write a call. In fact, I might not have. Um, like uh, what's it called? Options permissions. Like I have permissions for level one options, or which is a risk um, access that your broker gives you. Like I'm not sure I can write a naked call, for example. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question. I'll just try and uh, uh, narrow my question. Um, you you buy puts. You never sell puts. I sell to close. I don't sell oh, to yeah, open. Yeah, tr true, but to open to open the trade, you always buy a put to open the trade. You never sell a put to open the trade. Correct. It, it, how did you come to that decision? I can't remember. Okay. I, I must have been how I learned. I don't know. I can't remember. Yeah. Well, a lot of the th you 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 you've kind of nailed it. A lot of the things that I do is because well, that's how I learned. <laughs> you know? And if I had success with it, I just kept doing it. 
Yeah. All right. Thank you. Selling selling oh, options has yeah. other risk. Um, you have to have enough cash on hand yeah. in your account versus when you buy an option, you just have to pay for whatever it costs and that's it. I mean, maybe it's a limitation of a cash account also that maybe I can't short options in a cash account. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. You know, you're, you're definitely buying for the quick trade type of. Sorry, I'm, I can't I'm, hear you now. Okay, I'm sorry. You're definitely wired for, you know, these quick trades in the uh, in the time delay, right? Uh, the decay. You seem to have a very good uh, skill set for that. I think that's really think important it, for every a, trader to figure out what their pers trading personality is and to trade something that's aligned with that. Yes, yes. That, that's the point I'm trying to make. You know, for me, I analyze and some overanalyze, right? So if I'm only overanalyzing, you know, I, you know, I get burned <laughs> a lot. So I, I guess. I'm gonna I'm gonna try your technique and see how it pan out on not on, you know, on paper trading and see how it make it out. But I'm not sure I'm wired for that type of trading. So yeah. Do we have you, any you're, you're, Yeah. All I can say is you're you're phenomenal. That's that's awesome. So. I shined a good light on it. I have losing trades also. <laughs> yeah, but you got a good percentage. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I am very impressed. I mean, for my trading, my problem's always been I, I mean, for me to even execute a trade takes me several minutes. Uh, it's just a combination of uh, the, uh, my just getting over my fear and entering the trade and then getting it off with the software that I'm using, which is, is horrible. So I, but I was gonna look at Schwab and transfer to them, it sounds better. I think there's a lot that has to do with knowing how to use your software. Like you could use a stop order to enter, for example, or I mean, depending what your, Speak to the broker who you have now and tell them what you want to do. And there may be tools you don't know they have. But before you go learn something entirely new. Uh, the, oh, last question. The software from Swab, is that a software or is it you have to download it to your computer? It's, I downloaded it. Okay, thanks. And by the way, Schwab has terrible mobile trading. Their mobile app is oh. unworkable for trading. It's terrible. The, oh. the, the desktop platform is, or whatever, that I have a laptop, it's good. But the, I mean, one of my rules for myself is I don't trade from my phone. That was a, yeah. not, a not winning prospect for me. So I don't, I don't trade from my phone, but and so it doesn't matter to me that Schwab is bad at that, but they're bad at it. <laughs> well, that's good to know, because I only trade from my phone. So yeah, you don't need Schwab. <laughs> yeah, I mostly trade from my phone on TD Ameritrade because I've made so many mistakes on their platform. It's, uh, but phone is is easier and less. Error prone. Yeah, but you have the advantage, Jay, that um, from according to Angel, when you are on your mobile app, you can just stay on it and then decide what you're going to do. With Merrill Lynch, who I inherited going back to Quick and Riley, long story, won't go into it, but with Merrill Lynch, I call them the dundering herd. Uh, you get logged off every 10 minutes on the mobile app. I mean, it, you, you, it's it's like ridiculous. So, 
Yeah. Uh, the, uh, just a positive note, the Thinkorswim developers are working on adding support for Schwab users. So. I, I have a lot of mixed feelings about that. Do you use TD Ameritrade or Schwab? Uh, yeah, I use TD Ameritrade. Um, it's it's got its complexities, and I'm not quick at entering, and exiting. So I don't know if it's me or the platform. I'm scared that they're going to drop Street Smart Edge and make everyone use Thinkorswim, and I don't know what I'll do. If that happens. Well, hopefully it's a long process and give everybody time to migrate over if they want. Yeah. Well, it reminds me when TD Ameritrade bought Medved Quote Tracker and 100,000 people complained. So they kept it. They, they decided against canning it. They, they held it for two years till everyone sort of disappeared and then they killed it. And because of think or swim. But uh, Medved Quote Tracker was great. So. I had my whole operation based on it. So how about uh, real quick, and then we're going to wrap up here. Lorraine, are you still on? Do you have any questions? Uh, James S., P., Chris, uh, Kai, Kai Lil, anything from any of you, you people? Or Beth? Or? Beth, this yeah, was an excellent yes. presentation. Thank I really you. enjoyed it. And it applies uh, to uh, my poker playing too. All of your rules, <laughs> everything applies to uh, <laughs> professional poker playing. So. I found that um, I got into a phase many months ago where I was prone to um, revenge trading. And I realized that it was something like going on tilt. Mm -hmm. And I went to go learn about going on tilt and there were tons of poker and online gaming resources about the psychology of tilt that were very applicable to trading also. Huh. In fact, one of the things you look for at the poker table is who is on tilt. You just have to be disciplined enough that you need to recognize right away when you are and everybody does go on it. But a smart poker player is always watching the dynamics of everyone at the table who just won a big pot, going to be careless, uh -huh. over pot, who just lost a big pot and is, and is steaming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of psychology in the, uh, I would say it's mostly psychology. Well, I don't know about poker, but trading for sure, mostly psychology. That's why I have a lot of guardrails to try to contain myself. <laughs> it's psychology and total concentration on what's going on. And that's why I like your approach of just trading for a half an hour, maybe, uh, particularly in the morning and, uh, and, and really focusing on, on so many different uh, uh, channels of information coming at you. you can also, only... I like that I don't have the, I don't carry the exposure around all day. I come in in the morning, I trade, and I leave flat. I leave empty handed. And then the rest of the day, I, I check the market because it's interesting, but I don't care. And then I sleep well at night. I don't wake up at three in the morning and check my portfolio or the futures or, you know, I'm just, I'm calm the rest of the day. And I, that's another thing I like about, it. it's not just the, the trading style, it's the attitude in the off hours that I can have. I do have a question. Um... Is there any recommended reading material for understanding options in Greeks? I have tried. I have tried option scalping the way that you described it um, in your presentation, and I found myself, you know, making a pretty good sum on certain hits and really just tanking my account on others. Um, so I do understand and have grasped the depth of how of how quickly an account can go. And like, I understand you as like, you know, if you really don't understand these things, you know, then just avoid it. But how long should a man avoid risk without saying to himself, I must learn about this thing? Okay, so the first 
thing I think is to learn about it. There were one of the slides, you know what I'll do? I'll share this slideshow and then you guys can. Um, but first of all, learn as much as you can. Maybe try to paper trade it a little bit. I mean, you might have to literally old school paper and pencil paper trade it because I don't know what kind of options trading, um, paper trading there is out there. But, um, and then when you start trading options, I mean, find the, find, you know, don't put more than 50 or $100 into it total. So if you lose the whole thing, you know, it's only a little bit and just don't trade for gains, trade for learning and see what it feels like to just trade one. Can you make 10% consistently? Can you make 20% consistently? Can you control your losses? You know, do you know how to use the software to set stops and et cetera? But the, the real money, once you paper trade, the next step is real money, but not at real size, real mm. money, miniature. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I, I have attempted, uh, I, I don't think I've ever entered into the paper trading phase ever. Like, I just never made it that far. I just always been directly in the account, mm -hmm. you know, tampering with with foreign, foreign objects. <laughs> and, and I have found myself like, I really need to learn this thing. Um, I did use, I do use TD Ameritrade, but uh, like, I never understood the concept of how to set a stop on a, on a, like I understand how to set a stop in a trail stop on a stock, but I don't know how to do that for an option or like how to tell if, if the percentage stop was great enough to make an actual good gain or to get out of it very quickly without being like, yeah, I think I should have just let that one go like 15 minutes ago. I feel like you should have um, a methodology for trading a stock. Mm. You should know how to trade a stock first. You should know what kind of setups you want to look for that you're good at trading and what kind of entries are good for you and what kind of stops and what kind of targets. Mm. That's, I think, the main things. And, and just figure that out about stocks before you add the complexity of options. So even if you just paper trade the stocks for a while until you figure out your personality and your methodology for trading stocks, and then you can figure out how to overlay the options part on that. And Khalil, um, paper trading is not something you work into. Okay. It's what you start with. I, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that was a couple couple of years, a little bit too late, you know, that's like 20,000 blown later, you know. <laughs> it, it, it is not too late. It's not too late. It is not too late. Yes, I, I do agree. <sighs> For a few quick things, uh, then I guess we'll, we'll close the meeting. So, um, you can use Zelle or PayPal if you want to donate two dollars or more to the group. That'll offset our costs. Um, to Rob Shapiro, R O B S H A P I R O at AOL.com. I put it in the chat. And then someone asked, we have an email address actually, which is um, DC Day Swing Traders at gmail.com dc day swing traders at gmail.com and our youtube channel is dc day swing traders and you can go there and please hit subscribe we want to keep this going and tell all your friends i did put a message to 400,000 people in stock twits under the spy uh, last night and today but I don't see 400,000 people on our Zoom. So I guess uh, I didn't have much of an effect that I tried. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone listens on stock twits. They only talk. They don't listen. <laughs> yeah. So thank you again, Beth, for a fantastic presentation. And thank you Thanks, all for everyone. watching. Uh, happy trading. Happy to talk to you. You can get in touch with me. I love, I love to talk shop.
Oh, wait, wait. How do we get in touch with you? At fast options. Go at fast underscore options. Go look for me on, I don't know, socials. You'll find everything. Gotcha. Good night. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you, Vaughn. Thanks, Ethan. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don, great to see you there, buddy. How you been? Been doing pretty good. Same old, uh, same same story. Are you working in Houston? Do you have a job or? No, I work online. Oh, you work online? Yeah. yeah. So, the the uh, they must be pretty excited about those Astros, huh? Uh, 